In the book, This is an Uprising, the authors note how whenever there is a rush to resistance, an explosion of protest, a student-led strike, or millions spilling into the streets, the perception is that this is some spontaneous and viral event, like a prairie thunderstorm or an unexpected tornado. But what if mass spontaneous uprisings are neither spontaneous nor flash floods? What if, in fact, it is possible to influence the weather? Not all revolutions succeed. Not all mass action delivers. But successful campaigns have an overarching framework through which acts of personal sacrifice can be channeled into concrete efforts that highlight issues and increase tension, that focus on real and specific demands, that have carefully developed strategies and tactics that provide the language that motivates and inspires, that breaks the back of opposition by meticulously finding the weakest points and then succeed in changing the course of history. Successful activists learn to be self-critical, to challenge our motivations, to pose inner questions about why we do what we do. So we begin this evening with a question. Turn to a neighbor, and if you've not met before, introduce yourself, and we'll take just a minute for you to answer the question as best you can at this moment. Why are you in this room? What brought you here? Go. I, I am here today because I am a child of a refugee. My mother, who died just 12 days ago, was a teenager faced with racist attacks who illegally fled for her life and entered this country as an enemy alien, working with no benefits or protections in a cherry pitting factory. I'm here because I come from a tradition that commands me to care for the widow and orphan the stranger and the foreigner, because my people remembered we were once enslaved. As the Tao Professor of Practice of Public Service and Leadership, I teach community organizing and advocacy. I believe in civic engagement, that the actions of citizens matter, that when the core values of our society or any society are threatened, individuals can join together to protect the civil and human rights that our democracy promises all its citizens and due process protections for all who reside within its borders. As we noted in the inv invitation, despite a long history that eloquently describes the centrality of protest to the expansion and dynamism of democracy, the skills needed to bring democracy to the street are rarely taught. We learn the more common forms of political and civic engagement, such as voting, signing petitions, and arguing with friends and family about politics. Now, in 2017, it is critical that we learn how to engage the world as effective activists. You have been invited here because we believe that popular protest requires passion to be effective, but also planning, organizing, training, and discipline. Drawing on the deep expertise of our four gifted leading practitioners, this training on nonviolent organizing, advocacy, and action is an opening act of anticipation that the NYU community, students, administrative professionals, professors, researchers, and friends may well be called upon to engage, perhaps more than any time in the past decades, in the uncharted terrain of political action, of mobilization, and even nonviolent civil disobedience. 
If necessary, it means to uphold the values that we have heard repeatedly expressed by the president of NYU, our deans and university senate. This is not a partisan statement, but a commitment this university has made when President Hamilton called on us to remain true to our community's values and adamant about supporting and making feel valued and welcomed those whose status has been thrown or could be thrown into question by changes in government policy. For us, this means immigrants. This means those who may be undocumented. This means welcoming and supporting and standing in solidarity with all, irrespective of religion or color or nationality, gender or sexual identity or political persuasion. Tonight is a collaboration of the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, our law school's Public Interest Law Center, and the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, and hosted by NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. In fact, we at Wagner are thrilled to be in the midst of developing <clears throat> a new concentration on advocacy and political action with a target to launch this fall and look forward to building a robust program that will prepare our graduates for activist civic leadership. And if you are taking part in this conversation through social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag effective activism. We're honored to have as generous gift to us the skilled talents of our four presenters, who as you can imagine, are deeply engaged these days in defending the rights of all. And we are also honored that you have chosen to spend this evening to better prepare yourselves as activists, to have faith <clears throat> that your actions actually matter, that you and I <clears throat> and others around the country and the world can in fact influence the weather and change the course of history. So let us begin. Daniel Altschuler. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I'm an organizer. I have to hear from folks or I get worried. Um, my name is Daniel Altschuler. I'm here from an organization called Make the Road New York. For those that aren't familiar with Make the Road New York, we're the largest grassroots organization in New York, both in New York City and Long Island, that is organizing in primarily Latino immigrant communities in Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Long Island. We have 20,000 members who come together on a weekly basis to identify the problems in their communities and decide how they want to work to solve those problems. In this moment, a moment of profound moral crisis for our country, and I'm sure on a wide swath of issues that folks in this room care about, our members have been at the front lines in resisting the anti-immigrant policies coming out of Washington, both from the president from uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and from others. So first of all, I want to say thank you to those of you who are here. I want to just start, show of hands, raise your hand if you've been to one protest in the last month. It's amazing. Uh, show of hands if you've been to three or more protests in the last month. That's amazing, and you're beautiful, and I want you all to give yourselves a round of applause. This is a moment, like I said, of profound moral crisis in this country. It is also one of just tremendous grassroots energy, right? Not just in New York, but I don't know who saw Tom Cotton's town hall in Arkansas yesterday. All the way to Arkansas, we have folks showing up in a way that certainly I've never seen in my organizing lifetime. And that's amazing. The question is, how do we develop an effective organizing strategy? because there's no shortage of issues to work on or things that we could do, right? I'm sure many folks here, you know, if we think about the things that have happened in the last few weeks and months, we think about issues that we care about. You may say, for me, the thing that I care most about are immigrants' rights and the fact that ICE is tearing apart immigrant families every day, mothers and fathers from their children, brothers and sisters, grandparents from their grandchildren, we are tearing apart families. And we've lived that already. Frankly, many of us fought against that during the Obama administration, and now we've seen a ramp up. And we need to ramp up in our resistance. Or we may care primarily 
about refugees and Muslims. And we may have just been offended that the ban that was passed, or that was signed, I should say, was such an affront to our values that we simply had to go to Terminal 4 or airports around the country. Or we may say, healthcare is a right. We must all have it. And we are going to fight like hell to ensure that no one takes it away from the tens of millions of people who have been able to acquire access to health care over the past years. Or we may say we believe in a woman's right to choose. And we believe that Planned Parenthood should not be scapegoated by folks on the conservative side. And women's rights should not be attacked. None of these are mutually exclusive. I bet you, of all those people who raise, raise your hands just now, you've been to a lot of these protests. And we are going to need to keep that intersectional energy going, where we recognize that I stand before you as a white privileged man, right? We have folks who have all different types of privilege in this room, but we all, and who identify with different communities. But this is a beautiful intersectional moment, and we have to show up for each other. There's no question about that. That being said, we're all going to need to go to a lot of these big protests. But I would also encourage you that in this moment, we think about what is an, if I'm going to, if you're a full-time student or you have a full-time job, is there an issue that moves me more than those others that I really kind of want to dig in on a bit more? And my guess is, for a lot of you in this room, that's part of why you're here, because you do want to dig in. It's not just about showing up to protest, which is really important. It's how do we affect the change that we want to see in the world. So the first thing I would suggest in terms of effective, and I'm going to talk about organizing, um, because I think of organizing as when people who are affected by an issue come together to address that issue and the problems they see to achieve solutions. And in per of particular primacy in organizing is people who are directly affected by an issue. So for us in the immigrant rights movement, it's not me making the decisions about what we're going to do and what our strategy should be. It needs to be our members. So the first thing I'm going to encourage you to do in terms of how to engage effectively in this moment is to think about what issue moves you most. From there, once you've done that, I'm going to suggest do some due diligence. There are a lot of amazing organizations. New York is blessed with a bounty of amazing grassroots organizations. I just put a smattering of them up on, the, up on this slide. So I'm here for Make the Road New York, we're an immigrant rights organization, an organization like New York Communities for Change, which works with us on a number of issues. If you care about inequality, the fight against uh, corporations taking over our government, then maybe you should check out NYCC. You're going to hear from the NYCLU. You're going to hear, well, I don't think we're going to hear from Planned Parenthood for today, but I encourage you to think about who's already engaged in this space and what are they doing. I'm 34, I guess I consider myself a millennial. Um, and so I share a generation with some of you. And I think one feature of my generation has been this notion of social entrepreneurship. We, we really want to, I want to go out and create my own thing. And that can be great, and it can be beautiful, and it can be needed. But before you do that, I would encourage you to think about what organizations are doing things and have been doing them for years and have a lot of skills and resources and knowledge, and maybe where can I best plug in? So once you've done that, I want you to think about whether you're doing it with another organization or whether you're organizing a student group, I want you to think about what is your goal? Now, some people are really mad as hell right now. Who in this room is mad as hell? <laughs> a lot of people are mad as hell, right? And we have to channel that towards a concrete goal. We have to think about what is it that we want to achieve? What is the, and we have to be as specific as we can. This photograph comes from a march that our members decided to hold immediately after the election. They held it five days after the election. There were 15,000 people who showed up in Midtown. And it was to say, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. We are here and we're not going anywhere. And the goal for our membership, particularly on the issue of immigration, we work on a lot of issues, but on the issue of immigration is we are going to fight for our families. And our goal is to keep families together in the face of what we know are tremendous, a tremendous onslaught from Washington. Juana, who you can see on the side there, that's Juana's son. Juana wants to remain with her son. And our members are committed to fighting like hell to make sure that that happens. 
and the thousands, and frankly, around the country, millions of families like Juana's stay together. So we want to think about our goal. And your goal may be even more specific than that. right? From there, you may say, well, I think the best, the best way to keep families together is to pass a particular piece of legislation. In this particular climate on the federal level, that might be challenging. But you might say, well, in New York City or in New York State, there's something that we can do. Right? There's something in New York State, for instance, that we can do about limiting cooperation between local law, state, law, state law enforcement and immigration and customs enforcement. Or you may have a different goal. But you want to start big picture, and then you want to try and drill down. And when you're thinking about your goals and how to achieve them, we have to think about power. Who, and this could be individuals or entities, who has the ability to influence events and to influence other people, to change the course of our country in this really scary time? Power can take a lot of different shapes, right? Power could be money. Power could be the ability to make a decision, right? It could, Donald Trump has a lot of power right now, right? Scary as it may be to a lot of us, he has a lot of power. We also have power, right? What the people have demonstrated in the streets and at town halls and in the courtroom have demonstrated in the past month is that there's a lot of bad stuff coming out of Washington, but we can also win because there's a certain power in the people. We may not have the money, we often say, as grassroots organizations, but we can bring the people. We can shape the national narrative. We can show up. We can put direct pressure on folks. So when you're thinking about your issue, and you've identified what your goal is going to be, my suggestion is to think about a matrix like this and to do a power analysis. And we can share more details. I only have a few minutes with you all, but we can share more resources on how you're going to do this afterwards. And I know there's going to be a follow-up session that talks a little bit more about power. But often we think about, so from on the vertical axis, we have people with no influence or institutions with no influence all the way up to the decision makers. Right? So somebody like, uh, well, let's leave it at that. And on the horizontal axis, we want to think about folks who are opposed to our aims and against our agenda. And then on the left, folks who are with us, right? who are with our agenda. Now, right now, to be real, in Washington, there are a lot of folks, I don't know how to work this, but um, there are a lot of folks in the top right quadrant, in the very far right, the top right quadrant, Folks like Donald Trump, for those who care about the ACA and health care, actually a lot of issues, you know, you might say, well, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell aren't far behind, right? There's a lot of power concentrated on a lot of the issues that I work on up there in the top right corner. What I would advise you to do when you think through this analysis is maybe focus a little bit less on the bottom right quadrant. And that would be like all the trolls who say racist things to you on Twitter uh, or you know, are commenting on those newspaper articles and saying things that you find really abhorrent. They're abhorrent, but they're not the ones that we're really focused on for the most part in our organizing strategy. As you do this analysis, and, I, and you might do it at the federal level, but you also might do a separate analysis at the state level or at the city level, you want to think about the whole array of actors. So that could be the decider. It could be the president. It could also be chambers of commerce, individual members of Congress as well. And so to give you a sense, let's see if I get, oh, I did make it work. Great. Um, so let's imagine that Donald Trump is over here, right, on immigration. Or, or let's take health care. Okay, and he said, I'm going to repeal the ACA. Now, we, particularly like the grassroots left in this country, may have, the question is, how do we get the decision and the people who make the decisions to come more over to our agenda and ultimately to achieve our goal? And so it may be we don't have direct leverage over Donald Trump. But it may be, and we've seen this playing out at town halls across the country, that we do have leverage in individual congressional districts that people who have less power and who maybe aren't quite as ideological opposed to us as the White House is in this moment. And then we have to think about, OK, well, if this, the people over here have influence here that we don't have, how can we just keep pulling? Is it through showing up at people's town halls? Is it through writing op-eds and letters to the editor? Is it through direct action? You're going to hear more about tactics. But that's how you start to develop your strategy, and you start to think about who are your targets. 
Today, I was at a protest outside of Representative Leonard Lance's office. He's a New Jersey uh, member of the House of Representatives. He had a raucous town hall last night as well. He supported Donald Trump on these hateful immigration policies. But when we show up in Westfield, New Jersey, that spooks them. That spooked him a lot, right? And if people in Westfield, New Jersey, and Elizabeth, New Jersey, keep showing up at Representative Lance's office, then we may have the ability to continue to pull those people who are really making the decisions toward our agenda and to prevent hateful policies or to overturn them. So we're going to try to understand power. And that's going to inform the strategy that we have and the targets. So we may say, we want to think about who is in our neck of the woods. In New York, you might say, OK, we don't have that many. Well, maybe if you live in Staten Island, you have Dan Donovan, right? I saw a hand, we have at least one Dan Donovan constituent, and you should show up and call every day if you care about immigrant rights or if you care about health care. Maybe you were at Bay Ridge with us protesting last week, too. Um, or maybe it was this week. It's a lot of protests. Um, so you want to think about your targets, and you also want to think about what your strategy is. And by strategy, saying we're going to hold a protest is not a strategy. It's a tactic. And we're going to hear more about the tactics that we want to use. The strategy is how do we achieve our organizing ends? How can we move our targets to achieve the ends that we see as beneficial to our societies and our, to our society and our communities? And it might be that you think, OK, I know this particular target who's critical to my campaign. And I know that she responds to corporate pressure. She cares a lot about companies. She cares a lot about finance. And that might lead me to develop a strategy that's focused on corporations. Corporations or donors or individuals or entities who are complicit, who have said good, who we can pressure to say we are against this and to exercise or to utilize the pressure that they have to move our targets. So we're trying to think about power. We're identifying what our strategy is. And from that, we're going to inform our targets. And I want you to think, when you think about targets, this is not just about Republicans, right? This is a nonpartisan event. A lot of us, all of us, I'm sure, have our political leanings. Um, and I encourage that. Um, a lot of us have been deeply offended by what's been coming out of the White House. But sometimes the place that progressives and folks in places like New York have the most leverage is not with Republicans. There's not that much we can do about what Paul Ryan does or, or thinks. But what we do have in the Senate is a filibuster. And right now, there are enough Democrats in the Senate to, fil to filibuster hateful politics and politics that, hate our, uh, that hurt our communities. And so Chuck Schumer, for instance, has been the focus of a lot of people's organizing in New York to say, we need Democrats in the Senate, not just Chuck Schumer, but a lot of Senate Democrats. We need Democrats in the Senate to hold the line, to say, we will not accept this, to say, in the upcoming fight on the Supreme Court, we will not allow a vote to move forward on Neil Gorsuch. Because we know the pain that that will bring on our communities. We also have to think about state targets in our organizing. In New York, it's critical that New York hold the line as a blue state, a mostly blue state. For those that don't know, that's Andrew Cuomo. Uh, forgive me, I couldn't find a more flattering photograph. Um, <laughs> and that's Jeff Klein. Folks may not know who Jeff Klein is. But he is the leader of a group of break-off Democrats called the Independent Democrats here in New York State, who caucus with the Republican Party. And what we've seen is that there's been tremendous grassroots enthusiasm focused on the Independent Democrats, because people are saying, in this moment of moral crisis, it is not acceptable. We need all Democrats to stand up together and to resist and fight back against the hateful politics coming from Washington. And we need New York to be a bulwark of progressivism. So I want you to think, as you move forward in developing your organizing strategy, I want you to think outside the box about our targets. Because we are going to protest this guy a lot, right? But it's really important to protest the other guys, too. Because often they are more sensitive to the type of pressure that we can bring, whether by calling offices or protesting or any other type of creative direct action that you all come up with. We're going to move on in the next piece of this uh, sequence of talkers 
um, to thinking about tactics and how we deploy a sequence of tactics that build on each other. And we often think about an arc of escalation in the pressure that we can then bring to win on our campaign. I just want to finish with one note, which is I come at this from an organizing perspective. That is about, ultimately, it is about empowering other people. And in particular, organizing is rooted in empowering directly affected people and indirectly affected folks on a range of issues, working together to build their power. Often we think these are some models that I'm suggesting we move away from. They're like, I'm the leader. I'm here, and I'm going to do amazing things. And I'm going to convince you all to do what we need to do, and let's go march. Or sometimes we just have a group of folks who are just like, oh, we're all leaders. We're all going to like just do it. And, but there isn't that type of coordination. And what I want, to, want you to encourage, I want to encourage you in your own organizing to think about how do we create inter interdependent structures of leadership that are resilient, that have people within, with real roles and who are working and empowering other people. So you have a web of folks who are organizing together. The other, the really beautiful thing about interdependent leadership in the context of organizing is that if something happens to one person, you got a whole lot of folks behind you who can step up, right? And we know, we've seen, we had uh, five folks who were arrested today in New Jersey blocking a street outside an immigration detention center, right? Those five folks cannot help us at the next part of the protest, right? They're beautiful and they took a courageous step, but we need other people who can step up as well. And so I want you to think about how do we build this in a way that is for the long term and the long haul, because this is going to be a long fight that we're in. I'm going to conclude there. I want to tell folks that if you're interested in the work that Make the Road New York does, we're an immigrant rights organization, as I mentioned. We also work on a number of issues like economic justice, LGBTQ rights, uh, police reform. Text ROAD to the number 52886 and we will send you updates about the actions that we're doing. We're eager, we have a network of allies that we're deploying in this moment to support the organizing that our members are leading, and we'd be eager and enthusiastic to have you with us. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So now turn, if you can find another person, and, and respond to the question that Daniel asked in the very beginning. What's your cause? Not, not what are all the different causes that are driving you crazy at the moment, but if you had to pick one in which you really can engage, because you're not going to engage in every issue, what's the one cause that you really feel most passionate about right now? Take a couple minutes to talk to each other. Thank you. And now, and now Reverend Do Noel D'Amico. Friends, it is an honor to be with you. And it is fitting in this time when the very sinews of our democracy are being challenged to remember that people in this nation and around the world have organized to overcome fear, injustice, and violence in the past against the odds and with great sacrifice and enduring hope. And the task comes to every generation, to each one of us, 
to ensure our nation is truly a nation that is of the people, by the people, and for all the people. Organizing and direct action are not simply about resistance. Organizing and direct action build human community around shared values and marshal those values to realize it in practice. I come from the field of human rights where I've seen in our own nation and around the world that when governments fail to protect the rights of people, people will step into that vacuum and strive to protect their own rights. And time and time again across history, people have stepped into that vacuum. They've propelled rights forward and by doing so, pushed governments to become accountable while building what they need. This is what the Coalition of Immokalee Workers did. The Coalition of Immokalee Workers is a human rights-based organization located in Immokalee, Florida, with which I've had the honor of working for more than 15 years. In the 1990s, the CIW identified some of the earliest cases of what has come to be known as modern slavery. They stepped in to find a way to fight it and woke up federal government to investigate and prosecute these cases and put resources behind it, which led to the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000. At the same time, when the Department of Labor's enfeebled enforcement of what few labor laws do apply to farm workers, farm workers didn't just shrug. They didn't give up. They looked elsewhere. They stepped into a vacuum and identified another way to achieve human rights in the workplace. They joined with consumers to demand that trillion dollar food chains require their suppliers to uphold workers' rights as a condition of continued business. And through consumer pressure, now 14 of the world's largest food chains have signed binding contracts to do just that and are participating in the CIW's Fair Food Program through which tens of thousands of farm workers' rights are being protected. The program has expanded and it's birthed a new model for achieving human rights using market force called worker-driven social responsibility. I tell you this background because there are two principles I want to underscore. At this moment, the vacuum of government abdication of rights protection looks like it is only going to get bigger. And so we want to look at those other spheres where pressure for human rights can also be made. The market is one of them. And if you had any doubt, even after the brief story I just shared, just look at consumer impact on Uber last month. Second, when organizing for human rights, those people whose rights are in question are the only ones who have an urgent and abiding interest in ending those abuses. Importantly, they're the only ones who know the insidious ways that these abuses happen in regularized fashion and know how to correct them. Therefore, by necessity, if we're going to be effective, those are the people that need to be in the driving seat. People who have been targeted by vicious policies or who are exploited by the operations of a supply chain are creative and strong. They're not victims. They're whole people. For those of us who care but aren't necessarily on the front lines experiencing such harm, our friends don't need our pity. They need our partnership. And the good news is that when we join force together, we're unstoppable. Organizing is about bringing the widest number of people together to achieve a certain goal. Organizing involves understanding who you are, what your resources are, and what you need. It involves commitment. There's a strategic component to it and a moral component to it. When farm workers from the CIW decided to take on these big corporations, they knew they couldn't do it alone. They needed consumers. The CIW's first consumer boycott was against Taco Bell. They first reached out to students because students were the target market of Taco Bell. So activating these students made a lot of sense. Then CIW reached out to the religious community because so many religious leaders had come to support their community in different ways. 
and because social justice is at the heart of so many religious teachings. And I want to pause here and say, as you're doing your organizing, don't forget the faith community. Some of you are already members of a faith community. Faith communities bring many, many resources to the table and exercise strategic influence. They are people who may not necessarily at first consider themselves to be activists, but they are people who care deeply. They are worth your cultivation and your partnership. These first two moves that the CIW took in their campaign for fair food were strategic. They identified the key influential sector, which were students, and then built off existing connections they had with the religious community. Then the CIW looked for groups who shared an interest in workers' rights and the food system. They reached out to community groups, organized labor, and food movement leaders. The fair food movement has one of the most diverse set of allies. People who might not align on other political issues are actually part of the movement together. It's very broad. Because at its heart, it's about recognizing the humanity of people, seeing them as human beings, not as machines to deliver food to the table or scapegoats for social problems. The CIW uses a human rights framework, and this is not a strategy, it's a value. The more that we can help people see our common humanity in our organizing, the more people will be drawn to the movement. So, once you've shaped your campaign and you've identified your key conditions and you've done everything Daniel's asked you to do, and you're attracting people because they're drawn to this struggle to improve the human condition, what do you need to do? You need to engage them. So how do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, you're going to need some educational materials and a style and language that makes sense for each constituency. The kind of materials you're going to put before the Episcopal Church aren't the same that you'll necessarily use to motivate the campus greens. It's best to have constituent leaders to help you develop those materials collaborative. That way, it will make sense in terms of resources, language, and format. Some of this is going to be hard copy, some of it's going to be electronic. Of course, by now you all know you need a website or something out there to host your materials, to feature your news, to allow people to sign up and show their support. And while incredible online organizing we have all witnessed, especially in recent years, I want to stress that if you're really about changing things over the long haul, you need to sit down with people face to face. You want to meet them face to face. So you'll visit community groups, universities, unions, houses of worship. You'll get to know their leadership and style. You'll want to speak with elected leaders. You'll want to get to know their staff that carry forward so many of their policies. You want to see if you can connect with professors and maybe have an opportunity to present an issue to a classroom full of students who are studying this. In these face-to-face -face encounters, you create the opportunity for exchange. And now I'm going to say do a little bit of research before you show up, too, so you know what the norms are and you can respect the, the way that those organizations work and have their being. In other words, treat them with the kind of respect that you'd want to be treated with. Nobody wants to be a means to someone else's end. But all of us value the opportunity to meet good people doing important work and know we have something to contribute. Now, having said that, not everyone will be able to do everything. But everyone can do something. Calibrate your asks for what an organization or an individual can do and then get them thinking a little bit more about that next step of how they can do more. Be sure to invite people to always think about who their connections are. Who are your contacts? Maybe they know an influential decision maker. They certainly know lots of other people to whom they can bring into the campaign. And have lots of ways for people to take action by simple actions, online petitions, all the way up to mass direct actions that require more sacrifice. Of course, good protocols of databasing your information and keeping it current and communicating with your base of support as, as you develop is really important. So organizing is bringing people together, but mobilizing is about moving people to act together. 
So once you define your action, and we'll get into this piece in a moment, we're going to look at a few different direct actions, right away you're going to want to identify just to save the date, to hold it in place. And you'll want to be in touch with key constituencies that are on your march route or might be providing housing or are located in a particular city or cities where the action is happening. You can come with an initial plan, but it's always best to work with these local people to develop something that's collaborative and strong. After all, they know their local resources best. It's also a leadership development exercise because the more you give people the opportunities to step up and contribute, the stronger your movement will be. Of course, then you get the information up and out of the web, through the website and in social media, but you also, friends, have to follow up with some good old-fashioned phone calling. Get on the phone and talk to them about who are they bringing with them. Not are you coming yourself, but who are the five people you're going to bring. Give them a target. Give them a goal. Check in with them periodically. And you know what? It works. People start getting excited about that possibility. They stop thinking like, well, I have a lot of other things on my plate. And they start thinking about, wow, this would be really fun. I think I'm going to call Joe to come with me. And I think I know three other people who would come. Finally, as you're preparing for an action, do some prep on media in that area, especially. And you don't have to hit the New York Times. You want to look locally. Do a story about the preparation for the action. That can help advertise what's coming and let people know this fabulous event is going to happen and attract even more people to the work. Now, the great thing is when people see you on the move in an action, they get attracted to it. And so in the midst of whatever your direct action is that you're doing, be sure to have ways to sign people up. It can be as simple as a clipboard with a pen attached to the thing. Don't lose track of it. It could be fancy like a tablet. It can be a check-in table. But some way, somehow, have a person able to join your movement right there during the action. And think about, as that action is happening, are you flyering? What's your communication to the people that are in the little vicinity uh, that you're going by, you know, send a flyer out to them so that you know exactly what's going on. Now on to action. Action itself, nonviolent action, is the moral means for exposing injustice, revealing power, and calling on the humanity of the opponent and the public to bring about change. Nonviolent direct action uses our bodies to create a demand and a vision. Such actions call for planning, discipline, and creativity. Direct action is not a one-off. It should be part of a campaign, and when, what you decide to do should help move that campaign forward overall. For example, in 2012, the CIW and its allies had done a six-day fast for fair food outside of Publix headquarters in Lakeland, Florida. And then we amped it up the next year to the 200-mile march in 2013. And I'm just going to show you a quick clip of this march. It's just two minutes. But I want you to listen for what workers are saying is happening in that direct action, for what students are saying, and for what religious leaders say. I just need a minute of your time. 15% of Americans are living in poverty. Will you sign a petition? Sign this petition to end economic... That wasn't it. That's funny. <laughs> Algunos hemos, han tenido que ir hasta el hospital, pero no fueron a su casa, regresaron a marchar, porque creemos en lo que estamos haciendo. La cual... 
coalición también representa esperanza, esperanza que se puede haber un mundo mejor. This is one of the most successful struggles of my generation. Y como gente joven estaremos siempre aquí apoyando y luchando la causa porque la causa de la coalición es una causa justa y ganaremos. We are winning respect for workers from some of the largest corporations in the world. We are Muslim, we are Unitarian, we are Christian, we are Jewish, we are the ethical humanist society, we are people of faith, and we are united with the coalition because we believe that with God, whatever name by which you call God, all things are possible, including human rights. No importa qué tan fuerte Publix piensa que es, El pueblo es más fuerte. No importa qué tan largo el camino. No importa qué tan larga la espera. De que vamos a ganar, vamos a ganar. Porque todos juntos sabemos que estamos por el camino de la verdad. Porque sabemos que para los trabajadores de Imoca y Thanks, Scott. <laughs> so I wanted to show you that snapshot to give you the sense of of a long march, a march with 2,000 people in it, a march with a vast number of different constituencies in it. And you heard the sacrifice. If you're doing a 200-mile march, there's some things that you have to plan for. So as we look at this, I want to, ah, sorry, there we go, some direct action planning. When you're thinking about something as involved as moving that many people over 14 days, over many miles, and some of you will think of other different sorts of actions that are involved, you have to take seriously your route, the time, the timings of our, how far you're going, or you're not going to make it where you're going, the order of the program, rest stops, food, sleeping arrangements, look at all those logistics up there, right? You've got to think about that when you're planning a big action. Permits, please start early. This process can often take a while. Identify one person from your organization to be your lead liaison. The medical team, you want some people on site who are your own people that can respond to simple first aid or emergencies. And your own security team who can give orders as necessary, help the crowd change direction, and can be resources to be called upon. And they should be really easily identified. Now, if you're planning civil disobedience, I'm going to let my next, the next speaker um, after, excuse me, the final speaker deal with that piece because that's complex. But let me say, if you're planning to go to jail or you're planning to get arrested, you need to think it all the way through, have a plan in place. So quickly, I'm just going to highlight a number of different kinds of direct actions that you might want to think about. Here's one where the Chua rabbis protested the ban on refugees and immigrants. Now, this is the reverse of CIWs, which has a lot of different groups involved, and it zeroes down to one kind of group carrying a particular message in their own tradition. We, too, were refugees. Let's not see people turned away again. Here you have my son, August, and he's standing next to the American flag. He organized his fifth grade class on January 20th as they were saying the Pledge of Allegiance and facing the flag. They then turned and faced the globe because they didn't want to pledge to America first, but they wanted to pledge America to the nations. Young, chi young children, young children get direct action, and they're critical in helping shape it. August is standing there at an immigrant rights rally with the flag as a value. You want to think about how your symbols pair with values. The boycott of Wendy's that's currently ongoing with the CIW utilizes Wendy's brand, and you'll see instead of old-fashioned hamburgers, it's old-fashioned exploitation because Wendy's hasn't joined the fair food program. There are hunger strikes, which through the bringing people directly to the foot of corporations in this instance, people have made a difference. There are survival needs like tent cities that can be turned into direct action to work for the housing as a human right.
site. There are occupations. Right now in Sri Lanka, women and their children have occupied land that was taken by the government, and they're not leaving till that land gets returned to them. That's going on right now in other parts of the world. Remember, there are people all over the world with experience working under severe repression to organize and win gains. Now is the time to think about our global partners as well as a resource. Again, the 200-mile march to give you a sense of uh, how long that thing stretched and imagining what's involved. And when you're thinking of protests, think about protests plus engagement. If you're going to be outside the headquarters or a government building, how can you engage with those who are inside? Here at a particular rally, the CIW said, doubt our poverty, walk in our shoes, and they delivered shoes to one of the executives at Burger King. And this brought a moral message and created a profound human encounter. A Eventually, Burger King did sign on to the fair food program, as did Taco Bell. And now, street theater. Street theater, it's an old tactic from the Middle Ages, but it's, it's alive and well today. This is an example of one in the Wendy's boycott. Street theater is, by nature, participatory. It brings people into solving the problems and creates a large set of excited, empowered people. I want to just close by saying that you know, it, at this particular time, we have an opportunity to think back over our history in the United States, to not think that we are the first to ever try to do something new. From following the North Star to hunger strikers who went to prison for women's suffrage, from the Edmund Pettus Bridge to Stonewall, we know our ancestors have been there before us. So if we ever doubt that we can make a difference, if we wonder whether it's possible, remember, we have, we can, and we will. Thank you. Thank you, Noelle, and now Jamila Brown. Thank you so much. She's going to talk about how do, how do we message? How do we pass that message? Thank you. Okay. So, my name is Jamila Brown. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you guys right now is how many of you know what your story is? Not a lot of people. All right, well, we can help you with that. So I'm the digital communication strategist at the Opportunity Agenda. We have heard a lot today about lobbying. We've heard about protesting, but we haven't heard yet about what you say at these protests. What do you say when you're talking to a representative? And that's what the Opportunity Agenda does. We are a social justice communication lab, and we work with artists, activists, social justice leaders, and other cultural influencers to shift narrative. We work with them specifically not only to tell their individual stories, but the collective story about how we build power, how we shift those persuadables, how we have difficult conversations with those who hold power in order to advance social justice. So like I said, everyone has a story, but why does story matter? Story matters because cognitive scientists have told us that that's how our brains actually understand information. We understand it through storytelling. And at the Opportunity Agenda, we created a story that we're actually using now to not only show how communications and culture shift narrative, but also because we feel that it speaks to the political climate that we're currently in right now. The video, please. I just need a minute of your time. 15% of Americans are living in poverty. Will you sign a petition? Sign this petition to end economic inequality? Hi. I, can, You don't think you can change their minds with your pathetic fires full of meaningless facts? <laughs> I control everything here! Their minds are locked! That's what you think, mindset! <laughs> like a job for a Helvetica Bowl. Mindset, you're about to get reset. Lift yourself up. 
yourself up by the bootstraps and then use those boots to crush other people. We believe in equality, justice, and opportunity! Oh, I really like that one. battle over the dominant narrative. Will the mindset box your brain? Will Helvetica free your mind? It's up to you, Helvetica Bowl versus The Mindset, to be continued. Great. Well, we're really glad that you enjoyed that video with the fabulous Helvetica Bold. So for us, Helvetica actually represents many of us. So before, she was Ariel Black. When you saw her going around asking people to petition, begging them for signatures, I know that's been me. But when she's Helvetica Bold, she possesses the power of messaging and communications through our shared values. Now, a story is only like woven together through a narrative, right? But it also, that video we just saw, touched on a lot of stories, you know? The power versus good versus evil, a David and Goliath type of story. So those are the things, and that's the reason why we wanna advance these kinds of narratives. The other thing that it introduced is the mindset, her supervillain counterpart. Now the mindset represents the dominant narrative, a dominant narrative that is against equality, that is against opportunity, that oppresses and suppresses people here in the United States. And that's the thing that, well, throughout the world, but that's the thing that we wanna be understanding when we're thinking about narrative. When we're crafting our own narrative, we wanna be grounded in values, but we also wanna be aware of the counter narrative. What is the spin to that? So why? Why values? What we've found is that by starting with values, you start at a point of connection with someone. It's a way in which to relate to people on a very humanistic level. So we saw a lot of that in the first two presentations where we talked about community, we talked about family unity. How many of us wanna see families being torn apart? How many of us are very connected and grounded in our communities? How many of us rely on safety and security for all people? So when we start from that point and then move into the issue areas, we actually get people's attention as opposed to just passing out flyers around aimlessly to people and them not hearing us. By starting with values, it's a point of connection where we all can start the conversation. So what we've developed at the Opportunity Agenda is what we call VPSA. Can you say that with me? VPSA. You guys are so good. So what VPSA stands for is Value, Problem, Solution, Action. Because the number one problem that people do is actually by leading with the problem. We don't start with values. And then we don't give people something to do. We don't talk about the solutions. We don't talk about not only a systemic problem, but a systemic solution to that problem and how we can move it forward. But through VPSA, not only can we ground ourselves in values, but we can also tell an affirmative story. We wanna talk about positive stories, positive alternatives to the thing that we're fighting against, to the thing that we're working towards, to the country that we actually want to be. I mean, how many of you feel that we're at a critical moment in this country's history where we can actually espouse to those values that our founding fathers claimed to purport, or we could roll back. We can go right back to where we started. Who do we want to be? So let's break down VPSA a little bit. So the value. The value is essentially, why should somebody care about your issue? Like, how are you going to convince somebody to come over to your side, whether it's your representative, whether it's a family member, with those difficult conversations that we have at family gatherings and Christmas and Thanksgiving and Hanukkah? Or it could be someone on social media that you're reaching out to. Why should they care about what you're talking about? They may not feel a personal connection to that story, but let's invite them in. Then we have to talk about the problem. How are we falling short of this value that you have associated with the problem? Why does it matter? Who is implicated in this problem? Who are the people who are affected by it? And who are the policymakers that we can assign responsibility to? Who are the players that we should be holding accountable to find solutions to this problem? So the solutions. You have a systemic problem. You have to talk about the systemic solution. What's going to make this better? 
how can we fix this? What are you working towards specifically? What is the change that you want to see in the world? And then finally, we have to assign an action. With every protest, with every single call, every petition, every single mo movement and motion that you make towards social justice, you have to activate people. That's why they call us activists. We are activated to move towards action. And in a day and in a time where we are inundated with messages, you have to make it concrete. You have to make it simple. Now, how many of you are signed up to at least five email lists? Exactly, like every day I, since the election I have signed at least five petitions a week, I'm going to three protests every day, I'm exhausted. So I need something that's gonna make it simple. As a millennial, I know that we have been accused of being clicktivist. However, clicktivism actually works. People will sign your petition with a click of a button. Make it easy for people, lower the barriers, but with every communication that you have, you have to have an action that corresponds with it. Give them something to do. And then finally, we want to talk about building this affirmative story. So in building this affirmative story, of course, we want you to leave with values. Think about what are some values. Actually, I want to hear from you guys. Can you tell me some of the values that you think are a part of our shared story that we can be using for the issues that you care about? Just throw some out. Fairness, absolutely. Justice, diversity, equality. Opportunity, dignity, dignity is a great one. And that's one that we're definitely hearing about when we're talking about immigration and separating families and detention, immigrant detention. We want people to live with dignity. And when you say that, when you think about just as a human spirit, how the human spirit wants to live free, how everyone wants to be treated equal, how everyone deserves a chance at fairness, how everyone deserves a second chance, which is another value that we share, that leads people into the, or into the conversation and guides them more. So in telling an affirmative story, we also want to do other things. We want to focus on positive solutions. So in talking about immigration, some of the positive solutions that we've seen there are sanctuary cities. We've seen communities rally around immigrants. We've seen restaurants close in solidarity. We've seen many of you, I'm sure, who showed up at JFK to support and to welcome people into the United States. So we want to see more of that. Let's actually focus on the country that we want to be. Tell that affirmative story. So one of the things that we do at the Opportunity Agenda is we actually do free trainings for social justice organizations. And one of them is the Close Rikers Campaign. Now, Rikers Island is not only home to the majority of the prison population in New York City, but many of them are actually being held for crimes without being convicted. So when we talk about closing Rikers, when we talk about prison abolition, people actually cannot conceive it. They don't understand it. So what we're working with them to do is to tell a story about what does New York City look like without Rikers Island? Craft that story for people. Let's use our creative imagination together to actually show what it looks like when we show up and we care for every single person. So let's focus on that. Then we want to tell a systemic story. Now, some of you said that you know what your story is. So I'll share my story. Now my story, of course, is important, but I'm gonna show you how my story is created to a larger story. I am an Afro-Latina, millennial, proud child of immigrants who got the name Jamila because my tío Cecilio immigrated from Panama to the United States and converted to Islam. What that means for me is that I'm connected to Black Lives Matter. I'm connected to the Latin American immigration movement. And I'm connected to the Muslim American movement because I care about my cousins who are practicing Muslims, my little cousins who wear hijab, and what that means for them. Now that actually helps ground my story, as Jamila, into a larger movement for social justice. We don't want to focus on individual stories because what that does, as important as it is, people like to say, it's one isolated incident. That's just one bad apple. No, it's not. We want to show that this is something that's happening across the nation that's happening in communities across the United States. How do we connect it to the larger picture? Be thinking of that. And then the last thing, remember, we're activists. We're active, we activate. We wanna give people an action. I can't stress that enough. We're here because we want to actually tell people how they can participate. What can they do? Now for me, this moment is actually very exciting. We were all talking about this backstage because we were like, oh, you guys have finally arrived to the movement. You've shown up, welcome. 
We've been waiting for you. We need lots of help. So we have a lot of people now who are so excited and so moved, you know, and wanting to get out there in the streets and wanting to protest. Let's activate them. Tell them and show them what they can do. And the same thing for our officials who represent us. We have to tell them, as their constituents, what we want them to do. They work for us. It's not the other way around. So make sure that you continue that action and you include it. So I'm going to give you an example of a current movement that has been extremely successful, which is Black Lives Matter. And for me, Black Lives Matter is not only personally important, but it's a great case study for narrative in telling a story, because it also shows how an online movement has moved offline and has become a part of the lexicon. You know, Black Lives Matter, if we were to think of it in a different way, is really like a brand. You know, it's something that people kind of want to be associated with now, to the point that Fayetteville, Arkansas, there's a population of 80,000 people for Black History Month, put up a banner in their town square that said Black Lives Matter. Now, if that's not progress, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we're using slogans, that we're doing things with, like, such as Black Lives Matter that not only spark conversation, that draw in persuadables, but Black Lives Matter, it's a value. It's a value and it's an action. It's a demand that we want to live in a country where Black Lives Matter. And it's inclusive. We, like, through Black Lives Matter, the Say Her Name campaign has sprung up about black women who have also been killed, assaulted, abused by police officers. It has brought up a movement of black queer folks, black trans folks, disabled black people as well. It is an inclusive banner that tells the story of black lives in the United States. And it also harkens back to the painful past of how black people were brought to the United States and the struggles that black people continue to live through and living in a country where black life still doesn't matter after hundreds of years of being here. So in conclusion, I want to encourage all of you to connect with me, connect with the Opportunity Agenda. We have free resources available for people on messaging and communications from topics from criminal justice reform to racial justice to immigration, poverty. Um, so please visit our website, opportunityagenda.org. And if you are a part of a social justice organization that's working on our issues, we would love to train you. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope you guys are moved. <laughs>
When do we want it? Now. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So that's like what it feels like to protest, right? And that's why we protest. Why do we protest? We protest because we can. Our right to protest, to demonstrate in the streets, is a critical backbone of a functioning democracy. And if we, it's only as strong as, as us going out and doing it. And it is the form of protest that they have no, and they, right, the powers that be, whoever's on your grid of ugly-faced white men, um, <laughs> whoever they happen to be, uh, they, have the, they have the power to put down all kinds of dissent. They have the power to pass laws that stop you at the airport. They have the power to keep you on Rikers Island. Uh, they have the power to cut off your health care, your social services. Um, but they really can't do very much when you're marching in the street. And the things that they can do always make them look bad. So we march because we can, because it's a thing that they can't put down in a way that makes them look good. They never come out looking good. Why else do we march? We march when we want to roar. We're putting our bodies in place of our message. We're communicating with people who are with us already, and we're communicating with people who aren't with us and don't understand what's going on, or maybe don't know our story yet. When we really want to roar, that's when we take to the streets. That's when we can really raise our voices, and we can do chants. Chants are the backbone of any successful demonstration. Um, so it's really important to get people riled up. And a lot of the activism that we see right now, and particularly, I think, um, clicktivism, as she said, which is a great term that we use now, and the Facebook thing. Um, I quit Facebook. I am a millennial, but I quit it. So you can do that, too. Um, it saps your energy. It takes energy away from you. Even sometimes signing petitions online, it's like an onslaught, right? You're getting a dozen of them um, a day, and you're like, which is this? Oh, God, I'm so tired. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you're never going to feel that way at a demonstration. When you show up in your body and your soul and you're yelling and you're chanting and you're shoulder to shoulder with people who have different life experiences, who share a certain point of view on something, or who even just want to like share, even if you have all the different points of view, but you know you want something to change, um, that's not fatiguing. That is energizing. That will bring energy into your movement. Nobody ever leaves a march and goes, oh, well, I wish I could have used my time better. Like, people leave marches and they're like, yes, like, where do I sign up, right? Like, where do I get more of this, this feeling? You can tell I'm such a junkie for this stuff. I love it. Okay, so that's why we protest. So how do we protest? So in New York City, you, and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the legal, just in New York City, the legal advice only applies here because every place is different. But in New York City, you're actually in a really good place to do public protest. So in New York City, you have the right to go out into the streets as long as you stay on the sidewalk and walk with your friends or not your friends or however many people you want, and you don't have to tell anybody about it. You don't have to register. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to buy insurance. You don't have to do anything. You could literally, everyone in this room could say, we're going to march to Stonewall, and on the way, we're going to chant how great this lecture was, and that's it. You could just do it. You could do it right now. Um, the only rule being that you can't block the sidewalk. But as long as you stay on the sidewalk and you don't march on the street, and as long as you don't block the sidewalk, you're golden. What else can you do without telling anyone? You can stand anywhere in the city on any public property, so a sidewalk, a park, um, on a, even a platform at the MTA, although there's some special rules for the subway, um, and hand out a leaflet. You could hand out a flyer, you can hand out um, any kind of brochure, program, anything, a business card, whatever you want. You can hand out written material to your heart's content. This is one of the most essential and most beloved First Amendment doctrines in, New in America, in the United States. The Supreme Court says you can hand out a flyer. And actually, a lot of these cases are from, um, were brought and argued by religious minorities. Um, and so we see how just the act of participating in the First Amendment, participating in dissent, moves the law forward in this area. Um, so in fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses are responsible for an abundant amount of First Amendment law. Um, and you could be too. Um, so yes, you can go out and you can hand out flyers all day long. You don't have to tell anybody that you're doing it. You don't, have, you don't need anyone's permission. So what do you need permission for? You can march in the street. If you have permission, you have to get a permit because you could get run over. 
um, and you want them to close down the street. So you can get permission from the NYPD to march in the street. Um, there are special rules about marching on Fifth Avenue because they're like, Fifth Avenue is too popular or something. So they, they'll, put you, they'll let you have other streets more easily. Um, but essentially, you could work with your local NYPD precinct to march on any street in New York City um, with a pretty easy permitting process um, that doesn't cost any money. And they pretty much always give you the permit. So you get a, an idea of how many people are going to show up. And you tell them what your route is. And you might turn up and see the barricades. You guys have seen the metal, like their interlocking gate things, like the NYPD loves those barricades. And we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, but with a permit, they might show up and put some barricades if you get the permit, because they know you're coming and they want to you know, have some control. Um, but you can get a permit and march in the street. You can shut down a New York City street with a permit. Um, you can also do a demonstration in a park. If you are a group of less than 20 people and you don't want to use a microphone, you can just show up. You can do that right now. You don't need to tell anyone. Um, if you're a group of more than 20 people or you want to use amplified sound, you can work with the parks department to get a permit. It costs like $40. Um, and it's pretty good. The only place you really can't do that is Union Square Park. Um, but every other park in the city, you can basically get a permit to have any kind of rally you want. Um, and Union Square, again, it's like this weird thing that the city is doing because it's like too popular. So it's a little harder. It's not impossible, but it's a little harder to get into Union Square um, to get a permit. But as long as you stay in a smaller enough group and keep moving and don't use a microphone, you could do that at Union Square. So a couple years ago, not a couple years ago, last year, oh my god, Donald Trump has only been president for one month. Okay. <laughs> so last year, we worked on a march with some organized farm workers in New York State. So to echo what the earlier speaker was talking about with the farm worker march, there was a farm worker march from Long Island to Albany to demand that farm workers be included in New York's labor, right, labor law, which they are not. Um, and we wanted to come to Union Square because that's where the farmer's market is and talk to the people who were sort of, you know, maybe they're, they're interested in organic food, they're interested in local, whatever, so maybe they'd be interested in like the person that picked their food not dying. It might work. Um, so that was our strategy. We were thinking this is a kind of a movement that people are into, let's go do this. So we had many farm workers with us, we had a, a whole coalition, um, and of course Union Square and the city said no, you can't come to Union Square, we're not going to give you a permit, especially not on a far farmer's market day. Way too busy. Um, so we just did it, and there were a few hundred of us, and basically our strategy was to keep moving, not to block any spaces or anything like that, to hand out the flyers. We had some young people who were doing street theater in the park, um, and we basically just sent some lawyers and watched what was going on and tried to make sure that we knew what was happening, and, uh, and it was great. It was easy. Nobody even batted an eye. So even though there are permit requirements for parks, as long as you're not using a microphone and as long as you're not a 1,000 people, um, you can do a lot of demonstrating without a permit and do that really safely. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the quirky rules of demonstrating in New York, some things you might not know that could get you into trouble. Um, one of the big ones is that in New York, weirdly enough, and people don't know this at all, um, there are there's certain rules about like what you can bring and what you can do at a protest. And some of these rules are really enforced selectively, which is, as you can imagine, really problematic. And so we saw them, some of them are like 100-year-old laws that were like, the NYPD was like digging them out of the vault for Occupy Wall Street. They were like, what do we have? What do we have? Like, how can we get rid of them? Um, so one of them is chalking. So riding on the sidewalk in chalk in New York City is actually against the law. It's considered vandalism, and you can be arrested for it. And you can definitely be fined for it. So we advise against, when we do training for people that are doing demonstrations, we advise against chalking um, exactly for that reason. It's totally selectively enforced. It's very hard to predict when they're going to come after you and why. And uh, what, So if you can avoid it, if that's not essential to your message, chalking can be complicated in New York. Another thing that is illegal in New York from, that dates back to like the Civil War days is um, two or more people covering their faces unless they're at a masquerade party. That's literally in the law. So if you're like designated, <laughs> this is a masquerade party, you're golden. But if it's not, and you just show up, and three people are wearing Guy Fox masks, or three people are covering their face with a bandana, you could get into trouble with the NYPD. And so we recommend, particularly for people who maybe have 
concerns about legal status or issues where getting arrested could be really, really devastating for them um, and they're not in, the, in a position where they can get arrested as part of the cause, um, to just stay away from that whatsoever. Don't cover your face at a protest. The third thing is you can't have any rigid support. So you can't have a sign on a stick is basically what that means. Um, and you'll see this a lot of times in protests. People will have the signs on the, um, like the shipping tubes, like the cardboard shipping tubes. Um, so as long as it's like cardboard, you're okay, but it can't be a piece of wood or a PVC pipe. And a lot of people don't realize this, but if you're working with an organization that has a banner, your banner almost inevitably has a PVC pipe running along the top, and they will make you take that out. Um, people don't know that. It's like a weird thing that I've learned from doing this, that like, how, how, what holds your banner together? And they're like, what? I'm like, There's probably PVC in there. Um, so that's a weird one that people don't realize, but that's really important. We also tell people if you're participating in mass demonstrations, try to take as little with you as possible. Um, and there's a couple reasons for this. One, if you don't have illegal stuff with you, then it can't get you in trouble. So just don't take very much stuff, and then you're a lot less likely to have illegal stuff. So it's a good time to leave like <laughs> any drugs at home or drug paraphernalia. Um, if you have prescription drugs, keep them labeled so it's very obvious like, that they're for you. Um, it's a good time to leave valuables at home because if you are to get arrested in a demonstration, it's very, very hard to get your belongings back from the police. So you don't want to have anything on you that it would be devastating if you lost. Um, sometimes you never get your stuff back from the police. It's, it's, it's an incredible odyssey to try to get your belongings back from the police. Um, and so we tell people, really, just carry as little as you can get away with, basically. Um, and one of the things that people always ask me, well, is one of those things that I have to carry an ID? So how many people think, if you live in New York City, that you have to carry an ID with you at all times? This is like, half, like about half, right? Okay, so the answer is yes and no, and it's kind of a trick, because that's, that's what the NYPD does. They like tricks. So it's a little complicated. Um, so you do have to carry an ID if you are a, a documented immigrant. So if you have a visa or a green card, there's federal law that governs what kind of identification you have to carry with you. So if you are in that category and you're not sure, it's a good time to talk to an immigration lawyer and they could tell you exactly, like, look, the law actually requires you to carry this document with you. If you are a US citizen or you're an undocumented immigrant, you actually are under no legal obligation to carry any ID at any time. Amazing, right? It's amazing. America is an amazing place. We don't have to carry ID. The NYPD can ask you for ID. And if you don't have identification and they feel for some reason that they need to identify you, most usually this is because they think you might have a warrant out for your arrest, um, they actually can take you and will often take you back to the precinct to try to identify you in other ways. Um, and that other ways is a little shady. Sometimes it can include fingerprinting, which if you're an undocumented person right now, you do not want them taking your fingerprints. Fingerprints are shared with the FBI automatically. Uh, and under secure communities, that is then shared with DHS and ICE. So you definitely don't want your fingerprints getting taken under any circumstances. So it's actually better to carry an ID if you have those concerns, even though you're under no constitutional obligation to, you have to balance, like, does it matter more for me to be like a contrarian, civil libertarian person and like school them on my rights? Or does it matter more for me to just end this encounter and move on? So that's a call that everybody has to make for themselves. A couple years ago, there was a guy, a like, civil libertarian, doesn't even begin to describe this guy, who actually spent six months on Rikers Island just to prove the point that he did not have to prove his identity to anyone. And they got, he's out of Rikers Island now, but that was that important to him. So um, make your choice, I guess, uh, whether or not you want to carry ID with you in a protest. But just keep in mind that in mass protests, um, particularly in permitted demonstrations, the, the risk of anything happening is very, very low. The NYPD is quite good at handling mass demonstrations. They handle a lot of them. You go outside of the city, we do some demonstration work in Syracuse and other places, it's more challenging. They're not as used to it. Sometimes the state police show up, it's awful. Here though, the NYPD, they're really used to this and they're pretty good at it, especially if they know what's coming. So if you are in, engaging in a demonstration, you're invited to come to something and you're trying to gauge, is this safe for me? That's a good question to ask. Do you have a permit? And if they do, then it, it's a very, it's pretty much a safe endeavor. Okay, 
really quickly, I want to talk about how to protect privacy um, in these spaces because um, you're carrying a lot of information with you on your phone. And you're definitely going to take your phone with you to the protest because how else are you going to tweet about it if you don't have your phone? It's like, you're going to have your phone. OK, so here's what you need to know about your phone. Here's the advice we give. One, during the protest, use a code to lock your phone, not your fingerprint. You could undo that and change it later. But when you're actually at the protest or any time when you have an increased likelihood of being arrested or if you're crossing a, an international border, use the code instead of the fingerprint. Why? Well, because you have a Fifth Amendment right that you don't have to tell them anything. right? You don't have to say your code. But you don't have a Fifth Amendment right for them to not grab your hand and smush it down on your phone. So just use the code. It keeps your phone more safe, more secure. The second thing I would do, if you, especially if you're planning something, and especially if the something includes civil disobedience or you're planning to get arrested, use an app that is encrypted to, to share those messages. Email is the least secure thing there is. Don't send this stuff over email ever. Email is just the pits when it comes to security. Um, and then your native texting app is pretty bad too. So what we suggest you use, and we don't endorse any particular app because they kind of, they all come in waves where it's like, this is the best one, and then it kind of it becomes not so good for some reasons. But right now, the one that I'm using is called Signal. And Signal is an encrypted app. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. And what does that mean? Well, it means if they requested my, my text because they want to find out if I was behind this people walking across the Brooklyn Bridge without a permit, um, and Signal turned them over, all they would get is like garbage. It would just be wingdings. It would just be, right, code. <laughs> Nothing. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be something they could read. And that's important. Signal doesn't have the code to unencrypt that information, so they couldn't turn it over even if they wanted. So that's a safer way to do any planning or any engaging in this. When we do protest monitoring, we use the Signal app um, to keep our protest monitors' communications secure. Um, so that's a really important thing. Last, I will say, you, if you get arrested, the police do not have a, an automatic right to search the contents of your cell phone. Um, this was a decision by the Supreme Court two years ago, a case called Riley, where even the Supreme Court, even these like old, dusty people that like sit in the library all day, <laughs> understood that cell phones are like a whole different thing now, and like so important and so private that uh, the police couldn't just look through it just by function of having arrested you. So when you get arrested, they take all your stuff, they look through it. They can't look through the contents of your phone as a part of that. So that's really important. That's a really, really important protection. Um, so it's something to know if you are in that kind of situation and you get your phone back and you're like, what is happening here? Um, or if you were charged with something because they found a picture or some kind of message on your phone, that they may have gotten that information illegally. And that would be something you want to share with your lawyer. One final point. If you're planning any big demonstrations, or, or especially if there's going to be uh, civil disobedience, you're going to be sitting down in the street or marching without a permit somewhere, um, we recommend that you work with, some, with supportive lawyers groups to make sure that you have both legal observers on the ground and jail support for the people that are getting arrested. So for legal observers, you can call the ACLU, the NYCLU. We do that. We provide legal observers. We'll document. We'll take pictures. We'll help tell the story of what happened at your protest. And we maintain a blog called the, first, the Free Speech Threat Assessment Blog um, to basically tell that our side of the story. Um, for jail support and for other things, if you know that people are going to be getting arrested or there's a likelihood that they will, um, I would recommend you to the National Lawyers Guild. If you've done a lot of demonstrating recently, you've seen them. They have the bright green hats. Those are volunteer attorneys who are trained to do things like jail support, to do legal observing, to help with in mass arrest situations. Um, and they can actually help you find, hook you up with defenders and all kinds of things like that. So that um, is a great organization to know if you're going to be doing this kind of organizing. So I will wrap it up there. There's a lot of in more information on demonstrating, but I would just encourage you to check out the NYCLU's website. And thank you so much for your time. Actually, Noel, Noel, you may have taken my papers as well with you. Um, so, so one more. We, we said 90 minutes. We've got. We started at, at 6:36. We want you to take just a minute. Turn to somebody and say, "What are you going to do?" I mean, what are you going to do now? Just turn to somebody and let's hear it. It's essentially impossible to see. 
see that clock. But he was like, there's a clock. It was just like a glare. <laughs> Somebody's down there. Yeah, but he never gave me any signal. I don't know if he was telling me I had five minutes left or I've been talking for five minutes. I was like, oh. I couldn't interpret. When I looked at him, he was looking at his phone. So I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll just keep going. Okay, tonight, this is just the beginning. We've begun to develop, or for some of you here, further enhance the skills you need to be effective, informed, and prepared activists, ready to face an uncertain future, knowing that our collective actions can change for the better the direction of this country and the world. We hope that you'll be willing to join us in three deeper training sessions we plan to offer you that you'll become part of a collaborative effort to support each other, to let us know any actions you're taking, to use our services to link you with the organizations and organizing efforts that match your political interests and concerns, some of which you heard tonight, and that you'll respond to calls for action by your colleagues in our NYU community and beyond. The contact information is posted here, and we'll follow up with an email explaining next steps. Our thanks again to Daniel, Noella, Jamila, and jo Joanna. Really incredible. And thank you. thank you. Thank you to my fabulous colleagues of the Wagner team led by Scott Soil, who orchestrated this event, by our fellow schools, and especially by each of you. As, as Adam Dop Agopnik writes, democratic civilization has turned out to be even more fragile than we imagined. Yet he forcefully adds, the resources of civil society have turned out to be even deeper than we knew. We are those resources. Heaven knows the world desperately needs each of us to stand up for all that is good and just and compassionate, to protect those most vulnerable and heal the hemorrhaging in our nation. This is the task of our age. We may not have chosen it, but you know what? We were born for it. Knowingly or not, we have been preparing for this moment our whole lives. It is ours to meet with courage and strength, and we shall overcome. Thank you so much, and good night.